Good evening, everyone. It's good to be back once again after just a short period of time and uh, to hear it affirmed that indeed uh, the morning has turned into dancing, lamentations is over, and uh, the fruit of lamentations is restoration. And since uh, the restoration movement is uh, well on its way, then indeed uh, we can look forward to a wonderful future because it's a future full of hope that the Lord has given us. And when I left New Jersey, I made the rounds. So in, in this uh, short few days, I've been to uh, Chicago, Houston, uh, Los Angeles, uh, two places in North California, then off to your northern neighbor to Winnipeg, and then to uh, two places in Toronto. And I'm uh, very, very elated and encouraged by the response of the brethren and I think I can really say that uh, North America belongs to the Lord through CFC, Foundation for Family and Life. In fact, it's very, very interesting because uh, at least here in the U.S., out of the, six origi uh, out of the seven original council members, because as you know, you have two councils now, national councils, <laughs> out of the original, uh, six out of the seven uh, are, are with uh, CFC FFL and uh, much of the different states and the regions, possibly with the exception of uh, the Florida area, are really a majority for uh, CFC FFL. But that was not the case in Canada because the, what they had done in Canada was uh, the whole National Council just uh, aligned itself immediately with the International Council and prevented uh, information or the issues from filtering down. You know? So they were very, very well restricted and the National Council in effect just spoke for the rest of the body and said that they were there you know, on, on, on that side. But you cannot prevent the spirit. So uh, people who were aware of the issues started, and, and seeing what was happening, started to look into the need for restoration. But uh, very interestingly, because I was just in, in two places, Winnipeg and uh, Toronto, uh, Winnipeg, the, the brethren there are very, very vibrant and alive and very, very well organized. And they have their, they have their ID, gave me one. So, <laughs> not, not the sticker type, which we use in the, uh, in uh, the Philippines, well, we just put a sticker over it. But they've got their own, they've got their organizational structure with all of the brethren in the different positions. They've got their own bank account. Uh, and, and everything is uh, moving quite well. And the uh, movement, the restoration movement is uh, growing every day. It was even more striking in Toronto because as you know, Toronto is the center of Canada. And that's where the National Council of Canada resides, all of them. And that is the center of uh, Angkok, Canada. And uh, restoration there started with just about three couples that, you know, were, were, were aware of the issues and uh, were saying that we need some, to do something about it. In fact, one of them, out of purity of his heart, decided he would just resign as a cluster head. And he didn't try to influence anyone, but he just resigned because he could no longer serve uh, in that situation under the present uh, structure. So it just started with three of them, and that was only about a month or so ago. Uh, when I was there, uh, they informed me, they informed me that 10 out of 15 chapter heads are with CFC FFL. <laughs> and we had a very, very large gathering, overflowing, people, people uh, standing up uh, in, the, in the two uh, sessions that we had there. Place like Vancouver, I didn't visit it this time, uh, there was no time, but that started basically with one couple who was, you know, uh, bothered and who uh, believed in restoration, and now I read in the email that uh, they made a declaration there are quite a few of them. I, I just quickly glanced through it. I didn't count. But they openly now declared themselves you know, members and leaders of CFC Vancouver who are for CFC FFL. And I have no doubt that that movement is going to grow very, very rapidly. And hopefully, if I'm able to return in October, 
and I'll pass by there. Maybe, I don't know, by the grace of God, because this is His work, that the same thing that happened in Toronto will also happen there. And the Spirit cannot be contained. And I think all of these are confirmations that we have chosen the better part, that we don't want to be overly burdened as Martha's, but that we really need to sit at the feet of the Lord as Mary's, not neglecting serving Him, of course, but making sure that the more basic foundations of family life renewal, our relationship with the Lord are growing in holiness, and the evangelization that comes with that is not compromised for uh, anything that uh, is also important in what the, call, the, the Lord calls us to. So, the, the Lord did bring us to lamentations, but even as we were lamenting, we did say that that was a journey of hope and joy. But now, the fruit of lamentations is restoration, and as there is happening, and will continue to happen, then we are beyond the point of just being laid low, uh, even as there are still difficulties and conflicts and uh, instability and uncertainty, but we are moving on. And we're looking straight for the future, and it's a very, very bright future indeed. Because it is the Lord who is Lord of that future, and as long as we understand uh, His mind and latch on to His heart, then we cannot go wrong. So, I proclaim a future full of hope. And that's what Lamentations was all about. It was all about hope. In the midst of the greatest trial, in the midst of the greatest pain, the writer of the book of Lamentations looked to hope. Because the mercies and favors of the Lord are never exhausted. They are renewed each day. So great is His faithfulness. And we experience the deepest pain. Uh, that pain is still there today. After being blessed by the Lord for over 25 years and soaring in the majesty and glory of God, we were plumbed to the depths of uh, even division within the body. But, you know, all of that gives birth to a new life. And, and uh, the pain and the purification that happens with it and even the conflict that allows that to happen is a great opportunity that the Lord has given us. And so that, that's what we're looking forward to. And uh, as the Lord gave us that theme for the year, it's a theme of hope, that is the very same thing that we look forward to as we are now well on the way with this restoration movement and concretely through the Copos for Christ Foundation for Family and Life. I'd like to talk a little bit more about this hope so that we, we understand because this is, this is what we hold on to. Uh, the pain, the, the, the conflict, the confusion is not yet over and uh, there will be great difficulties still in the months ahead but if we know where we are about, if we know what God is doing, if we know the ways of God which includes pain and purification, then it will not shake us. In fact, we cling more to Him and we are strengthened uh, because we can rejoice even in the pain and suffering that we all endure. So it's all about hope. And, of course, our classic text for uh, when we talk about hope is uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And this was uh, spoken by the prophet Jeremiah to God's people when they were in exile in Babylon. They had been defeated, they were sent, they were deported to Babylon, so they were no longer in their homeland, they lost their freedom, uh, they were second class uh, people there, and they didn't know uh, what was going to happen, and it seems as if their God had abandoned them, and this is what the prophet Jeremiah spoke to them. For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for woe. Plans to give you a future full of hope. And those are very comforting words. And uh, many times, you know, we read it and we feel, well, how could that be true? 
when when I'm in the depths and and I see no no, no future, how how could that be true? But precisely, you have a God who speaks the truth, who is faithful to His promises, who enters into covenant with His people, who is never outdone in generosity, and He can always be relied on that His word is true. And and He says, I do have plans for you. I have not abandoned you. I have not. You have not lost me. My mercies are always available. Something is just happening in your lives, but I am still there. And the plans I have for you are always for your welfare, not for woe. No matter what happens, even if you think otherwise, even if you think that, you know, this could not be good for me, because it's so painful, but that is in accordance with God's plan. Because His plan is always to give us a future full of hope. We see this through the history of God's dealings with His people. How God's love is really solid, is really enduring. How God's plan will be carried out no matter what. And, and, uh, but, but also we see that when God enters into a covenant with His people, we also have our part to play. So, God's love is unconditional, His faithfulness is unquestioned, but the fruit of the covenant, which are the blessings that come with the covenant, experiencing those fruits are dependent upon our response. And when we respond in the right way, then we, we, we experience the great, wonderful fruit of being in covenant with God. But if not, then we suffer the consequences of that. So, it really depends on how we respond. From the very start, God created paradise. And, and uh, paradise was God's intent for everyone, including us. And, and paradise, it was, it was heaven. It was a perfect situation where God related directly with His people. And there, were, there was no problem at all. There was no darkness. There was no pain. It was just perfect because it was living with God in the kingdom of God. But because of man's response, paradise was lost. God's blessing is dependent upon our response, how we respond to this great love of God. He wants to pour out bountifully His very self, but we need to respond in the right way. God's people uh, became uh, uh, slaves in Egypt for 400 years after uh, the, the patriarchs had won favor with Pharaoh. But then when another Pharaoh was there, they uh, who did not remember uh, how, how the patriarchs had helped, and uh, they lost his favor, and they were, they were enslaved, and they were there for, for centuries. And what God did, was to bring them out of slavery in Egypt, brought them into the desert where He entered into covenant with them. He accomplished miracles to be able to bring them out, and even in the desert, He continued with the miracles in order to provide for His people. But because they did not respond properly, they became rebellious, they became disobedient, they became idolatrous, then they needed to water in the desert, and those who were 20 years and older, except for Joshua and Caleb, all died in the desert. They were not able to enter into the promised land, including Moses. So God had His plan. I bring you out of slavery in Egypt. I bless you in the desert, provide for you, enter into covenant with you. I intend to bring you into the promised land. And that's God's plan. That is at his heart. That is what he would have wanted to happen. But the people did not respond well. And so they died in the desert. But uh, those uh, uh, less than 20 years old, after their surgery in the desert, then they were able to enter into the promised land. And again, it was what God promised. A land flowing with milk and honey. And he built them up into a very, very large uh, kingdom. And uh, they, were, they had their renown, and they were winning military victories, and they were very, very wealthy, and had influence throughout the world. And that was part of God's blessing. 
where God wanted to show the world that His people, His covenanted people, experience such wonderful blessings, and that is the result uh, of, of worshiping Him as the one true God. But again, because through the years, many kings were uh, disobedient, idolatrous, and, and uh, uh, David, who was a man after God's own heart, uh, committed uh, adultery and even murder. And then his own son, uh, Solomon, uh, became idolatrous. And so after him, the kingdom was split. And eventually, the northern tribes were, were destroyed and they disappeared from the face of the earth. And uh, Judah, southern tribe, was uh, also conquered uh, successively, deported, and they banished also from the, from the sea, from, from their own land, for many, many years. Until in 1947, they went back to Palestine and the state of Israel was created. So again, the wonderful plan of God, the bountiful blessings that God wants to pour out upon His people, plans for your welfare, not for woe, plans to give you a future full of hope. And, and God opens up this whole future and say, it's a wonderful future that you're going to have. But then, you know, he speaks about woe because God knows that if it were only up to him, it will be a future full of hope, for, full of our, for our welfare. But then he also implies, and, and there is that warning that if you don't obey, then it will, it will be a future full of woe. And that is what has happened as we've gone through the history of God's relationship with His people. So, God's love is unconditional. God is faithful, period. There are no conditions to that, even when we are unfaithful. But the blessings that come from being in a covenant with Him is dependent upon our response. So, how should we respond? Well, the prophet Jeremiah also says it in uh, succeeding verses, 12 to 14, says, When you call me, when you go to pray to me, I will listen to you. When you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me with you, says the Lord, and I will change your lot. And how do we remain faithful to God? How do we... Uh, through that faithfulness, how do we appropriate the blessings that come with covenant? We pray. Because prayer is a relationship with God. It is an acknowledgement. You are God. We are in covenant. I'm totally dependent upon you. I want to enter into a relationship with you. And so, I speak to you. I listen to you. And we, we communicate. And that is prayer. And we are to seek Him daily. And and. You know, it's, it's not just once in a while. It's not just when we have the time. We are to seek Him daily. That relationship is an ongoing, constant relationship. And we are to desire God. And, and to realize that He is the one and greatest good. And, and uh, whatever is happening around us, there is always the good that is God. When our most loved ones fail us, there is always God who will not fail us. We, we need to desire to be His people. We need to be able to live out our covenant. And then when that, those things happen, God can change our love. It's happening. And, and uh, you, you, you think about the happen to whether it's first through the lands and no longer having an identity, God can change that love. And so, brothers and sisters, if that is the kind of God we have, and if we do have a covenant with Him, then what that translates to is hope. No circumstance will ever be so bad or so terrible that we can say, my life is hopeless. I have no future. I'm going to give up. I'm going to kill myself. No, never. Because there will always be hope. When we have such a God who is in covenant with us, who loves us with that eternal love, who is faithful to us even when we are unfaithful. We need to understand what hope is all about. Hope is not just optimism. There are people who are optimists. Uh, well, things might be bad now, but I'm, I'm sure you know, things will work out tomorrow. 
That's like optimism. No? Just, just uh, and you say, I hope, no? I hope that this thing, uh, my situation will change, it will be better. It's not just optimism. Optimism is part of it, but it's not just that. Hope is not just blind trust. Blind trust is, well, God is in control. No? Uh, even if I don't do anything, God will work things out. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. God is in control, but God acts in and through us. For example, one, one, one uh, big aspect of that is God wants to bring His people back to Himself. And the way that He does that is by sending forth His workers, that's us, to evangelize. Now, if we say, no, this is God's plan, He wants to bring everyone back to Himself, God loves everyone, and so I'm just going to sit here anyway, God will find a way to evangelize His people. It doesn't happen that way. And, and uh, God will just act in this way or that way. No, uh, we, we participate in, in that work. That is how God asks. And we, it's not just blindly trusting because of God's love that things will happen in a good way. Hope is also not being simplistic about evil, about pain, about suffering, you know, where we say, well, yeah, yes, there's, there's evil and suffering uh, in, in the world, but anyway, God is still there, no? so no big problem. Uh, you just need to endure through that. And, uh, it's not being escapist. Recognize uh, that even though I could be robbed, I could be mobbed, uh, something worse. Uh, it's not being overly spiritual. No? Just anyway, whatever happens to me anyway, you know, that's what God wills. Maybe something negative happened to you because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And, and you're just expecting God to, to shield you and to provide for you and to make your life uh, uh, a life full of hope and joy when you're not doing anything to cooperate with the grace of God. So it is not just that. It is not having hope because of these things. Now, there, there are elements of true hope, but it's not ju just that. So, hope, according to the church's uh, definition, is a virtue where we desire heaven uh, or eternal life as we trust in Christ's promises and as we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is what hope is. It's a virtue that ultimately we look to heaven, we look to the eternal reward. Uh, but in doing so, as we go through this life, we are trusting in the many promises of Christ to His people, and then we tap on to a power that is outside of ourselves, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why hope is always connected with God, true Christian hope. It, hope is in God, our hope is in God, our hope is through God, our hope is with God. And that is what true Christian hope is. Because it is connected with God, then for us to appreciate hope, it always has to look at what God has done. How has God acted through history that proves that I can trust in Christ's promises, that the power of the Holy Spirit is there? How can that happen? So my hope is not just based on, well, there, there is a very, very uh, nice forecast for the economy in the next year. So if I have a business, I, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm going to make a lot of money. It's not just that. It's connected with God. And it is based on how God has already acted. Especially as He has acted in seemingly impossible situations. Because if it's not such a difficult situation... Human beings can remedy that situation. But if it is a humanly impossible situation, but God was able to act, wow, what a wonderful piece of good news of historical data that I can base my hope on for the future, whatever is happening in my life. So what were these? For example, he called Abraham. And uh, he told Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. But he was already past his prime. And his wife was already sterile. Hindi no? na pwede. Hindi na pwedeng mga anak. No? 
But it was the promise of God. You'll be the father of many nations. And of course, it happened. And, uh, you know, the, uh, his wife, uh, when, when it wasn't yet happening, uh, tried to provide a human solution because she could not give birth. So she gave her slave, uh, Hagar, uh, to Abraham. And he had, he had, uh, uh, they, they had uh, a son, Ishmael. But that was not what God promised. No? Because uh, that was possible. That was humanly possible. And they provided a human solution to it. But what God wanted to show was that when He makes a promise, even if it is humanly impossible, it is going to happen. And of course, uh, eventually, uh, He did have uh, that, that uh, Isaac with, with, his, with uh, Sarah. You know? And that's what God showed. When we looked at the uh, people of God that were slaves in Egypt, and they were there for 400 years, and that was an impossible situation. I mean, if you've been enslaved for 400 years and you have no power at all, and that's even what uh, your children and your children's children have grown into, you know, because, because many times if you know what another life is, then you become discontent, then you, you start a revolt, you know? but if you were always born into that, then ah, they, they didn't have any internet at the time, television where you could see ah, in another land, how come, uh, you know, this is all that they need something else, even if there was one in their hearts that longed for something else, that desired to be out of the slavery, the only life that they knew, uh, there was no way that it could happen, they didn't have the power. But as we all know, God acted. And God, through a series of miracles, the, the plagues, uh, liberated them and eventually brought them uh, into covenant in the desert and into the uh, promised land. When uh, Israel and Judah were conquered because of their own infidelity and their idolatry, uh, they lost everything. Uh, as I said earlier, even the, the, the northern tribes when they were conquered and, and exiled and dispersed, they just disappeared from the face of the earth. Uh, the southern tribe of Judah was also conquered and dispersed and brought into exile. And there they lost everything. And there seemed to be no chance that they would get back together again. And even through the years, the Jews were still there. Uh, they were wanderers throughout the land. They went into uh, many different uh, lands. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, uh, God gave them the opportunity, and again, in, in 1947, they all came back and converged in Palestine, and the state of Israel was born. After many, 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 many centuries, where by right, they should just have disappeared, because they were no people, they had no land, they had no uh, true, distinct identity, uh, they were persecuted. There was the Holocaust uh, during the war. And, and all of these things were happening, but against all human odds, they became a state, and now they are a mighty state uh, in the present world. So, God acts, and, and you look at that, and you see, this is how God acts. He has acted. It's not theoretical. God doesn't say, hey, you know, you trust me, I, I'm going to do good things for you. Don't worry about it, whatever is your situation. It's not that. He has already acted. And it has, he has acted in a very, very marvelous way. At the, at the core of all of this is covenant. That's why covenant is so very, very important. Because with covenant is the definition of our relationship with God. And with the covenant comes the promise of blessings and of course, the counterpart of that is you don't leave out your part of the covenant. God is patient, but after a while, it might take a few centuries, then you could really lose it all. So that's at the very heart of God. If hope, as we said, is related to God, hope, our hope is in God, our hope is through God, our hope is with God. If hope is related to God, then in order for us to have hope in our hearts for our future, no matter what the circumstances, we need to have that deep, intimate relationship with Him. And that intimate relationship with Him is what is called covenant. It is defined by the covenant. 
when we keep the covenant, then we will be extremely blessed. So, brothers and sisters, the call to covenant is fundamental. It is basic. And then, of course, we talk of uh, our covenant as Christians, and that's for every Christian. And then we have our covenant in Corpus for Christ, so that's a more specific uh, covenant. And these are all fundamental to our life in Him and to the definition of our life and mission in the world today. And the covenant provides for us the foundations for hope. And hope is what the future is all about. Uh, the future of a Christian who is in covenant with God is defined by hope. I like to take uh, the word hope and uh, use that as an acronym, H-O-P-E. So for four, four uh, aspects that are important in order that we might be helped to live out our covenant and in order that we might really have hope. So first, H is holiness. H is holiness. And if we say that our hope is uh, dependent on our relationship with God, on an intimate relationship with God, then obviously God is at the core, God is at the, at the center, uh, God is the defining reality of how we ought to live our lives. And this is what God says in uh, uh, talking about the covenant at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. It says here, Therefore, if you hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my special possession, dearer to me than all other people, though all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So if you keep my covenant, you will be special. Because we've already defined that. Covenant is what it is about. And he, uh, as we live out that covenant, then God says, well, 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 this is wonderful. Uh, you are my special people. And you are a people who are living out your covenant. But what does that mean? You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Covenant is all about holiness. Holiness is reflecting the very image and likeness of God. That's why 1 Peter 1, uh, 15 to 16, For as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in every aspect of your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So this is what God says. You have a covenant with me. I am at the center of your very life. Your future is dependent upon your relationship with me. Now look at me. I am a holy God. And you are to reflect my image and likeness, and so you too be holy. Be holy because I am holy. And that is the problem with Christians today. We lack holiness. We're not even maybe thinking about holiness. Or maybe we don't understand what is holiness. But we need to realize that holiness is at the very core of our relationship. And it determines the blessings that we will derived from covenant, and it determines the future, whether it is full of hope or it will be peppered or even uh, dominated by woes. This, this, this holiness. So, practically speaking, well, how, 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 how can we look at holiness? Well, there are many ways that you can look at that, but uh, I like to look at uh, the, the, uh, what the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 24. Verses 3 to 4. Who may go up the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in His holy place? The clean of hand and pure of heart. Who can stand in the holy place of the Lord? Who can go up to heaven? Who can dwell with God forever? And it says, it is those who are clean of hand and pure of heart. It means clean in and out. It means clean in action with our hands. It means clean in thought, in motivation, uh, which is in our heart, in and out, being clean. And, and these are the people who will be holy, are holy, who can enter into the presence of the Lord. But 
We need to be more specific because how, how, how do you find, define being clean? So we, we look also at what the psalmist says in Psalm 15, verses 1 to 5. The, the question is the same. Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy mountain? And these are now the people who, who can do that. Whoever walks without blame, doing what is right, speaking truth from the heart, who does not slander a neighbor, does no harm to another, never defames a friend, who disdains the wicked, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath despite the cost, lends no money at interest, accepts no bribe against the innocent. These are just a few specifics. So holiness is very, very specific. It's not something, you know, nebulous, way up there, uh, floating on air, uh, you know, being holy, holy. It's not that. It's very, very specific. It talks about moral integrity. It talk about, talks about doing justice to others. It talks about uh, perfect sincerity in speech. That's why, brothers and sisters, even in our conflict that we have experienced, a lot of this was violated. And that even we, in CFCFFL, need to be careful that, you know, in spite of any provocation, in spite of any thing that is done to us or said to us, that we, we, we conform to this. You, you, don't, you don't retaliate in kind. Because we need to speak truth from the heart. And, and uh, there's, there, there has been many untruths. There have been many lies that have, have just been peddled. We do not slander a neighbor. All the more so, you don't slander a brother. But this has happened. You never defame a friend. Uh, especially if uh, what, what you say to defame a friend is actually not true. But even if it were true, you don't, you don't just go around and spreading it uh, uh, indiscriminately in order to bring down or put down a brother or a friend. So, th th these, these are some of those uh, aspects. So, integrity, sincere speech, zeal for God, justice. These are the elements, the specific elements of holiness. So, holiness, well, that's why we also have our uh, specific uh, covenant. So, you have a definition of covenant, the overall, which is being a Christian, relationship with God through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have the covenant of uh, a couples for Christ. No? And then you have more specifically what is contained in a covenant card. So, you know, like things that we need to do uh, in order that we might live out that covenant, the, the other two covenants. It's not actually all just one, but uh, uh, more specific. And that's why we stress so much prayer. That's why we talk about reading the Bible every day. That's why Christian formation is crucial. That's why we need to do service so that we look beyond ourselves. That's why we need to come together in fellowship so that we grow together as Christian brethren. That's why as Catholics, we participate in the sacraments. And the wonderful blessing to those who are in community like ours is that all of those are elements of community life. Because the call to holiness is the same for every Christian. It's not just for the Pope, it's not just for, for the budding saint, but it's, it's for each and every one of us. But unfortunately, there are many others out there who do not have the support environment. And it's very, very difficult to, to, to grow in holiness if you don't have spiritual formation. Or if you just go to your parish once a year, annual retreat, but that's it. It's very, very difficult when you're not constantly coming together with brothers and sisters who love you and who are interested in your welfare and who will correct you if you are straying from the path. So this is all what God provides for us in community. So when you say, how do we grow in holiness? Live out your covenant in community life. Be faithful. That's why many times we miss out on that. You know, I feel tired. I'm not going to my household meeting. Or I feel a little bit sick, I'm not going to my prayer assembly. But we need to think, God calls me to holiness. And it's very, very difficult to become holy. And we know that. We struggle through it. 
And we're never really going to make it. It's just that we hope that through life, we advance a little bit more so that we will be more acceptable to God. And so that we might spend a little less time in purgatory. No? But it's very, very difficult. And so we need to see, here is the blessing of God. Here is the provision that God has given. He has given us community life. And all that I need to do is live it out. Pray every day, read the Bible every day, attend the meetings, undergo the formation, uh, uh, accept service, uh, fellowship with one another, partake of the, of the sacraments. The first, that's, that's the first uh, aspect, uh, the foundations for hope, and that is holiness. The second O uh, can stand for obedience, and uh, this is obedience to God. Not obedience to man, because uh, that is something that even in this in this uh, conflict uh, had always been uh, uh, spoken about by one side, which is uh, you know you just obey. Uh, we have the authority, we have the mandate, so you just obey. And so we need to remind everyone: it's not about blind obedience; it's about active submission. But we're talking here about obedience to God. And in fact, the other aspect of this obedience of uh, is uh, obedience to the church because uh, that is also one big area that uh, caused uh, the difficulties and uh, people were saying that uh, well you know I prayed and God told me this but uh, the bishop said if you're not obedient to the church then you cannot really claim to be obedient to God maybe you heard God maybe you were but but if the church the bishops are telling you differently and you don't listen to them because you say you prayed and this is what God said you can never be sure. Because obedience to Christ means obedience to uh, the church through her bishops. So, obedience is very, very crucial. When you take a look at the longest psalm in the Bible, that's uh, Psalm 119. And it just talks about, uh, it just keeps repeating many different ways to describe obedience and the, the law of God. It talks about the law, uh, commands, teaching, decrees, edicts, precepts, you know, they're all describing it in different ways, but it all means the same thing. God gives us His commands, God gives us uh, the way that we are to live our life, and we simply need to obey. And disobedience is uh, a very woeful thing. Because remember that this is a relationship with the Almighty. This is a relationship with a holy God. If, if, you, have, if you have a transaction with, with another person uh, and you uh, did not leave it out, or, or if, if a child disobeys the parent, or, or an employee uh, disobeys the, the instructions of the employer, uh, you would suffer some consequences, but you know, you, uh, you'll get through it, no big deal. And some people are already inured to that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mind, no? uh, it, it doesn't really affect me. But when you're talking about God, it's a serious matter. This God who went out of His way, and when you talk about the New Covenant, this God who shed His very life for us, and now expects that because He has entered into this intimate, personal relationship, that His people need to obey. And obedience is in fact what is good for them. Because if left on their own, if left on our own, we would certainly stray from the path. And so God says, here is my law, here is my direction, this is what you need to do, these are my commandments, if you just obey, then you have no problem. And when we don't obey, then that's when we get into a lot of trouble. And God says, He says in Deuteronomy 28, Verse 15, But if you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and are not careful to observe all His commandments with which I enjoin on you today, all these curses shall come upon you and overwhelm you. And then he speaks about all the different curses. A curse will come upon you, will overwhelm you. You cannot bear that kind of a burden. You will be laid low, you will be crushed. If you, if you don't obey, if you're not careful to observe all the commandments that God enjoins on us. And that, that, is, that is a very, very fair warning. 
And if we are cursed, of course, there is no hope. When you're cursed, and because of your relationship with God, then there is no more hope. And, and uh, this is the serious consequence of all of that. Of course, the contrary of that is if we obey, we are blessed. For example, when we talk about, uh, well, we always talk about uh, uh, financial stewardship. When we talk about uh, the, uh, the tithe, giving back to the Lord, uh, what is due to Him, and giving, giving Him a, a tithe. And these are very familiar uh, teaching to us from the book of the prophet uh, Malachi. And here in uh, Malachi 3 verse 10, God says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So that's, that's, the, that's the command. And what is the purpose of that? So that there may be food in my house. So food is life giving and you bring it into the storehouse which is the church uh, and that food is distributed in order to give life to people. So money is used for mission, money is used to bring the light and life of God uh, to, to the world from the church. But then it doesn't end there. And then he says, and try me in this. Subukan niyo ako. Sabi niya, challenge. So, try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. Shall I not open for you the floodgates of heaven to pour down blessing upon you without measure? And then we see the consequence of obedience. When, when you do this, I will not be outdone in generosity. When you do this, you're going to bring food into the storehouse so that can be distributed. But don't just think, okay, here you are, you're doing your God a favor. No. It's not just that. It's not just from you going to God so that God can do His work. Because God pours it back to you, does not just give you the same, not just twice or three times, but He says, I'm going to open up the floodgates of heaven. A, a downpour, a literal downpour that will inundate you. A downpour of blessings. I will pour down blessing upon you without measure. You cannot say it's twice, it's three times. You cannot measure it. It's just so overwhelming. It's just so overpowering. And, and again, that is the reason for hope. But uh, many people miss out on that. Uh, because uh, in the first place they find hey, obedience are really hard. Uh, I'd rather be not so obedient and follow my own way and uh, live a life that I define to be pleasing or comfortable. And so we actually miss out on the blessings of God. It might be tithing, it might be in other ways. You know, we say, well, I looked at my budget and I really cannot afford to give 10% to God. You know, so I do not. And so you scrimp on a few hundred dollars but miss out on the outpouring of grace and blessing that comes with simply obeying the word of God and living out your covenant. So obedience is very crucial in order that we might have that future full of hope, full of, full of overwhelming blessings. P can be poverty in spirit. And uh, poverty in spirit uh, basically is uh, uh, total dependence on, on God. Uh, that, that I cannot do things on my own, no matter how intelligent I am or, or you know, what experience I have. Uh, it is always totally dependent on God. The, the, the most intelligent, the most accomplished, the, the greatest businessmen or politicians or what can easily fall by the wayside if God withdraws His favor. And at the end of the day, it is really the favor of God that uh, uh, allows me to experience wonderful thing. I'm to things. I'm totally dependent upon Him. When you look at the Beatitudes, talking about poverty in spirit, Matthew 5 verse 3, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, poverty in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And again, we saw it earlier. If you talk about heaven, that is what hope is all about. What is hope? It is the virtue by which we desire eternal life, we desire heaven, we desire uh, permanent eternal communion with God. That is what we look forward to. We go through this valley of tears and eventually we make it there. And so if we were poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so poverty in spirit is 
the way by which we can take hold of that hope and know that the reality of that hope is already at work in our, in our lives. But this kind of poverty in spirit, that's kind of like a heading for the Beatitudes, but it goes on all the way and we need to see how we need to live that kind of life which reflects poverty in spirit. And even in this uh, conflict, uh, I think uh, there are many who actually violated this. Uh, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Uh, the meek uh, renounce violence. Uh, uh, the meek are able to accept uh, suffering and persecution uh, without having to retaliate. Uh, the meek can suffer injustice, but uh, do it you know, not because, not because you know, I can do anything about it and I'm so weak. You know, meek is not weak, but uh, it is uh, with a strength of fortitude that says, well, uh, this can work for my good. And uh, if this is purification, then I am blessed uh, through that and I can meekly endure that. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart. Again, that talks about integrity. You know? And then, for they will see God. We saw that in the psalm. Uh, if you have moral integrity, then you are the one uh, who can enter into the tent of the Lord, who can ascend uh, to, 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 to the Lord's house. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Again, in spite of whatever uh, provocation, even if uh, the other party does not deserve it, we're still willing to uh, live in peace. Uh, even when there's intense conflict, we'd like to see how can we still be brothers, how can we, uh, how, even when there's division or separation, we try to see how we can remain as friends, preserve those relationships. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And again, when we experience that kind of persecution, uh, in meekness, in poverty of spirit, but uh, we're not just persecuted because of our own wrongdoing, but because precisely of the right that we do. You know, whether it is standing up for the original charism, or whether it is uh, uh, speaking the word that those who veer away from the original charism are no longer acting in accordance with God's intent for CFC. You know, and because of that, uh, people speak against us and people uh, lie and malign. Well. That is, that is a blessing because we suffer persecution for the sake of righteousness. And again, the kingdom of heaven is ours. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Where, where in the world can you find something like that? No? Where uh, they insult you, they persecute you, they uh, bear false witness against you. And you're still smiling, and you're still rejoicing. Uh, because only the one who is growing in purity of heart, only the one who is uh, growing in a clear conscience, only the one who is growing in holiness, can see something there that the world does not see. And for the world, when those things happen, it is terrible. And, and, and if it's done unjustly, I'm going to get back to you. I'll either sue you, I'll, I'll strike you, or whatever it is. But the one who sees and who situates all of this within the inscrutable workings of God that is beyond our own understanding, see, this is a blessing. This is how they deal with prophets. This is how they deal with those who insist on righteousness. This is how they deal with those who cling to God and want to grow in holiness and, and because of precisely who they are, what they are doing, and many times it goes against the grain, but it is right in the Lord, then they experience their persecution, but they know that when that happens, that is a blessing. It is not a curse, it is a blessing. So, there are many things that we can, we can uh, take on, that we can understand in all of this, but basically... It is having that kind of poverty in spirit, that kind of attitude. He feels are persecuting him, will retaliate, but the one who uh, has that relationship with God, who understands what poverty in spirit is all about, you know, uh, can, can, can go through that because that precisely is what brings true hope. 
And then E is uh, empowerment in spirit. The, the other three are crucial, holiness, obedience, poverty in spirit. Uh, and now, given all of that, you also need to act. It's not just the formation. It's not just the personal growing in holiness. But uh, uh, a covenant always has two aspects. You grow in holiness, your internal disposition, but you also allow yourself to be used as God's instrument, the external action. And so, uh, we need to act because God wants to use us. And if we are growing in holiness, if we are obedient more and more to God's will and God's ways, if we are living out poverty in spirit in spite of any provocation, then that is what will lead to empowerment. And that empowerment, of course, is for evangelization and mission. Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The empowerment that comes because we are a covenanted people, and God works in us and pours out His grace upon us so that we can be a purer and holier people, so that He can use us as purified vessels in order to accomplish His work for bringing His good news to the ends of the earth. So, brothers and sisters, we talk of couples for Christ. Uh, the basic description, or one basic description of Corpus for Christ, it is an evangelistic and missionary society, aso uh, association. No? Uh, evangeliz evangelization and mission is at the core of who we are. It is the rationale for our being. It is why God raised us up. But what has happened is there has been a veering away from that basic call. And uh, this is manifested in a lack of holiness, you know, all the things that we have experienced that have been happening. It's manifested by disobedience to, to, to God's ways. Uh, if everyone involved in a conflict uh, lived according to the ways of God and obeyed, obeyed the commandments of God, there will be no conflict. There will be a disagreement, but after a time, you will be able to settle it. The fact that it's not settled means that one or both parties have not obeyed what are God's basic principles and values and commands. And we veer, we veer away uh, also if there is no poverty in spirit, if we are not totally dependent upon God, if we now act according to man's ways, if we become corporate, secular, legalistic, political, you know, all of these things that come from the world, when that happens, then that surely will uh, cause us to veer away because it's no longer that humility and poverty of heart where we recognize that we are just totally dependent upon God. When these things happen, when we veer away, then we will lose empowerment or empowerment will uh, diminish. And this is what has been happening for the past few years. And that's why we saw uh, an ongoing decrease in membership and eventually, uh, what we experienced this year, which is the conflict, which eventually led to division. But again, God's ways are not our ways, and in His inscrutable, inscrutable uh, mind and heart of God, uh, He's able to bring good out of the bad, He's bring to make, able to make straight crooked lines, and so uh, we have His people have veered away from his covenant and now suffer the consequences of that, but God can take that situation and because he is a loving and faithful God and he still has his plan for his people, he does not discard his people, then he can bring about restoration. And this is uh, what I believe is happening, has been happening with God allowing the establishment of uh, CFC FFL because this is all about the restoration to how it was, to how it ought to be, no? how it will be, so that Compos for Christ will continue to experience uh, the fullness of grace and blessing that God intends for His beloved people. We need to grow in holiness. We need to obey God in every way. 
We need to live out a poverty in spirit so that with all of this, we will continue to be empowered by the very Spirit of God. And when all of these things happen, then there will always be hope. For us personally, for our family, for our community, uh, for the life of the world, for the work that we do, and this is what we just continue to need to understand. As we now work at Restoration, it's an old CFC that is a new CFC. It is an old CFC founded uh, in 1981 that has experienced uh, God's blessings of 26 years, but it is new because it is a restoration. And this is the opportunity that God gives us to go back to the basics, to understand the covenant, to live our lives in, in holiness, obedience, poverty, and spirit so that we might be empowered, and to allow God to use us powerfully for the work that is ahead. Because that is what God intended from all eternity and, uh, and allow this plan to happen and raise us up uh, in 1981 and perhaps, perhaps even allow the painful conflict that we have experienced because there was a veering away and now there is the need for restoration. To me, it's very, very exciting because uh, once you appreciate what God is doing, what God wants to do, uh, what God can do, and you can be in the depths of despair and seemingly impossible situation, but God can truly turn that around and again bring us to a future that is uh, full of hope, you know, a future that is full of blessings. Our time of lamentations has been a journey of hope, uh, and we say it is a journey of joy, and when we appreciate uh, how it is, you know, and, and I think we continue to learn the lessons of Lamentations, even as we say Lamentations is done, the morning has turned to rejoicing, uh, but the lessons ought to be enduring, because the lessons of Lamentations are also lessons about covenant, faithfulness, and, and uh, just uh, turning our lives over to God, uh, repenting for any uh, wrongdoing that we might do, allowing God to take hold of our lives and move us forward. So, brothers and sisters, it's a new beginning. I'm very, very excited about it. I'm very, very hopeful. Uh, things might still be in a flux uh, for now, but I can already see the, the hand of God, uh, the Spirit really working. And uh, we just need to continue to pray and discern and discuss and offer our lives to Him and grow in all of these qualities because these are the elements that will allow us and Copos for Christ Foundation for Family and Life to really have a future full of hope and to be an instrument of hope for the life of the world. Amen.